Hi everyone. Happy 1st of December. I'll be giving the part 4 of the Bill of Rights and I hope it will be helpful. If you're not yet subscribed to our channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and let's study together. Thank you. Liberty of abode and right to travel. Rights guaranteed under Section 6 of the Bill of Rights. 1. Freedom to choose and change one's place of abode. And 2. Freedom to travel within the country and outside. Liberty of abode, it is the right of a person to have his home or to maintain or change his home, dwelling, residence, or habitation in whatever place he has chosen within the limits prescribed by law. Scope and limitations, the right is not absolute as there may be a law that restricts the freedom as when the person is a leper or a convict. The liberty of a vote may be impaired only a upon lawful order of the court and b within the limits prescribed by law such as public safety and security. Examples, persons in the danger zone areas like Pinatubo, Taal Volcano may be relocated to safer areas and evacuation centers in case of danger and emergency to save lives and property. Or number two, insane persons who roam around in Rojas Boulevard may be committed by the government to the National Mental Hospital for appropriate treatment and medical attention. Note, under Article 3, Section 6 of the Constitution, a lawful order of the court is required before the liberty of abode and of changing the same can be impaired. Question, pass, was employed by the Far Eastern Employment Bureau owned by Jocelyn. An advance payment has already been given to pass by the employment agency for her work as a maid. However, Pass wanted to transfer to another residence, which was disallowed by the employment agency. Further, she was detained and her liberty was restrained. The employment agency wanted that the advance payment, which was applied to her transportation expenses from the province, should be paid by Pass before she could be allowed to leave. Does the employment agency have the right to restrain and detain a maid who could not return the advance payment it gave? The answer is no. An employment agency, regardless of the amount it may advance to a prospective employee or maid, has absolutely no power to curtail her freedom of movement. The fact that no physical force has been exerted to keep her in the house of the respondent does not make less real the deprivation of her personal freedom of movement, freedom to transfer from one place to another, freedom to choose one's residence. Freedom may be lost due to external moral compulsion, to founded or grounded fear, to erroneous belief in the existence of an imaginary power of an impostor to cause harm if not blindly obeyed, to any other psychological element that may curtail the mental faculty of choice or the unhampered exercise of the will. If the actual effect of such psychological spell is to place a person at the mercy of another, the victim is entitled to the protection of courts of justice as much as the individual who is illegally deprived of liberty by duress or physical coercion. Cuanca v. Salazar, 82 Phil, 851. Right to travel. This refers to the right of a person to go where he pleases without interference from anyone. The limitations on the right to travel are 1. Interest of national security, 2. Public safety, and 3. Public health. Note, it is settled that only a court may issue a whole departure order against an individual addressed to the Bureau of Immigration and Deportation. However, administrative authorities such as passport officers may likewise curtail such right in the interest of national security, public safety, or public health as may be provided by law. DPWH may validly ban certain vehicles on expressway in consideration of constitutional provisions of right to travel. The right to travel does not mean the right to choose any vehicle in traversing a tollway. The right to travel refers to the right to move from one place to another. Travelers can traverse the tollway at any time they choose using private or public four-wheeled vehicles. Petitioners are not denied the right to move from point A to point B along the tollway. Anyone is free to access the tollway, much as the rest of the public can. The mode by which one wishes to travel pertains to the manner of using the tollway, 
a subject that can validly limited by regulation. Mirasol versus DPWH, DR number 158793. Question. PASEI or PASE is engaged in the recruitment of Filipino workers, male and female, for overseas employment. It challenged the validity of Department Order 1 of the Department of Labor and Employment because it suspends the deployment of female domestic and household workers in Iraq, Jordan, and Qatar due to growing incidents of physical and personal abuses to female overseas workers. PASE contends that it impairs the constitutional right to travel. Is the contention correct? No. The deployment ban does not impair the right to travel. The right to travel is subject, among other things, to the requirements of public safety, as may be provided by law. Department Order No. 1 is a valid implementation of the Labor Code, in particular its basic policy to afford protection to labor, pursuant to the Department of Labor's rule-making authority vested in it by the Labor Code. The petitioner assumes that it is unreasonable because of its impact on the right to travel, but as we have stated, the right itself is not absolute. The disputed order is a valid qualification there too. Philippine Association of Service Exporters versus Drillon. A member of the military cannot travel freely to other places apart from his command post. Mobility of travel is another necessary restriction of members of the military. A soldier cannot leave his or her post without the consent of the commanding officer. The reasons are self-evident. The commanding officer has to be aware at all times of the location of the troops under command so as to be able to appropriately respond to any exigencies. For the same reason, commanding officers have to be able to restrict the movement or travel of their soldiers. If, in their judgment, their presence at place of call of duty is necessary. At times, this may lead to unsentimental, painful consequences such as a soldier being denied permission to witness the birth of his firstborn or to attend the funeral of a parent. Yet again, military life calls for considerable personal sacrifices during the period of conscription wherein the higher duty is not to self but to country. Gudani versus Senga Watch list and hold departure orders. Note, right to travel is not impaired by a hold departure order. The basic reason for the rule is found in People vs. Ui Tuising, where it was said that inasmuch as the jurisdiction of the courts from which orders and processes were issued does not extend beyond that of the Philippines, they would have no binding force outside of said jurisdiction. Q. Several criminals' complaints were filed against former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. In view thereof, DOJ Secretary de Lima issued watch list orders pursuant to her authority under DOJ, which was issued pursuant to the rulemaking powers of the DOJ in order to keep individuals under preliminary investigation within the jurisdiction of the Philippines. Subsequently, GMA requested for the issuance of allowed departure order so that they may be able to seek medical attention abroad before the resolution of her application for ADO or allowed departure order Jamie filed a petition with prayer for the issuance of a TRO seeking to annul and set aside DOJ circular number 41 and the WLOs issued against her for being unconstitutional a TRO was issued but GMA was prevented from leaving the country is DOJ Circular Number 41 unconstitutional for being a violation of the right to travel? Yes. The DOJ has no authority to issue DOJ Circular Number 41, which effectively restricts the right to travel through the issuance of WLOs and HDOs or Whole Departure Orders. There are only three considerations that may permit a restriction on the right to travel, national security, public safety, and public health. Further, there must be an explicit provision of statutory law or rules of court providing for the impairment. The AOJ Circular No. 41 is not a law. It is not a legislative enactment, but a mere administrative issuance designed to carry out the provisions of an enabling law. 
DOJ is not authorized to issue WLOs and HDOs to restrict the constitutional right to travel. There is no mention of the exigencies stated in the Constitution that will justify the impairment. The provision simply grants the DOJ the power to investigate the commission of crimes and prosecute offenders. It does not carry the power to indiscriminately devise all means it deems proper in performing its functions without regard to constitutionally protected rights. DOJ cannot justify the restraint in the liberty of movement imposed by the circular on the ground that it is necessary to ensure presence and attendance in the preliminary investigation of the complaints. There is no authority of law granting it the power to compel the attendance of the subjects of a preliminary investigation pursuant to its investigatory powers. Its investigatory power is simply inquisitorial and unfortunately not broad enough to embrace the imposition of restraint on the liberty of movement. Genuino versus De Lima. Return to one's country. Q. Ferdinand Marcus, in his deathbed, has signified his desire to return to the Philippines to die, but President Corazon Aquino barred the return of Marcus and his family. The Marcuses invoked their right to return. Is the right to return a constitutionally protected right? No. The right to return to one's country is not amongst the rights specifically guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, which treats only of the liberty of abode and the right to travel. Nevertheless, the right to return may be considered as a generally accepted principle of international law, and under the Constitution is part of the law of the land. However, it is distinct and separate from the right to travel and enjoys a different protection under the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. Marcus v. Mangalacus Right to Information, the Rationale The purpose is to promote transparency in policymaking and in the operation of the government, as well as provide the people sufficient information to exercise effectively other constitutional rights. Armed with the right information, Citizens can participate in public discussions leading to the formulation of government policies and their effective implementation. An informed citizenry is essential to the existence and proper functioning of any democracy. Ideals versus Psalms, year 1920-88. Three categories of information. One, official records. Two, documents and papers pertaining to official acts, transactions, and decisions. And three, Government research data used in formulating policies. That is in Article 3, Section 7 of the 1987 Constitution. Electoral Debates Q. The online news agency Rappler, Inc. sued Comelec Chair Bautista for breach of contract, MOA, in disallowing the former to stream online the coverage of the 2016 presidential and vice presidential debates. Does Rappler, Inc., have a cause of action against Chair Bautista? The answer is yes. Aside from the fact that Chair Bautista clearly breached an express stipulation of the MOA, allowing Rappler, Inc. to stream online the coverage of the debates, the presidential and vice presidential debates are held primarily for the benefit of the electorate to assist the electorate in making informed choices on election day. Through the conduct of the national debates among presidential and vice presidential candidates, the electorate will have the opportunity to be informed of the candidates' qualifications and track record, platforms and programs, and their answers to significant issues of national concern. The political nature of the national debates and the public's interest in the wide availability of the information for the voters' education certainly justify allowing the debates to be shown or streamed in other website for wider dissemination. Rappler Inc. v. Bautista, GR number 222-702, April 5, 2016. Scope and limitation. The general rule is the access must be for a lawful purpose and is subject to reasonable conditions by the custodian of the records. Uh, exception. The right does not extend to the following. 1. National security matters. These include state secrets regarding military, diplomatic, and other national security and information on inter-government exchanges prior to the conclusion of treaties and executive agreements. Number two, criminal matters relating to investigation, apprehension, and detention of criminals which 
the court may not inquire into prior to arrest, prosecution, and detention. Number three, trade and industrial secrets and other banking transactions is protected by the Intellectual Property Code and the Secrecy Bank Deposits Act. And four, other confidential information falling under the scope of the Ethical Safety Act concerning classified information. That is, in Chavez v. Species, GG, GR 13716, December 9, 1998. Q. Adolfo filed in his capacity as a citizen and as a stakeholder in the industry involved in importing petrochemicals, filed a mandamus petition to compel the Committee on Tariff and Related Matters, CTRM, to provide him a copy of the minutes of its May 23, 2005 meeting, as well as to provide copies of all official records, documents, papers, and government research data use the spaces for the issuance of Executive Order Number 486, which lifted the suspension of the tariff reduction schedule on petrochemicals. Adolfo based his action on the constitutional right to information on matters of public concern in the state's policy of full public disclosure. Will the petition prosper? The answer is no. The state's policy of full public disclosure is restricted to transactions involving public interest and is tempered by reasonable conditions prescribed by law. Two requisites must concur before the right to information may be compelled by writ of mandamus. First, the information sought must be in relation to matters of public concern or public interest. And secondly, it must not be exempt by law from the operation of the constitutional guarantee. The information sought by Adolfo are classified as a closed-door cabinet meeting by virtue of the CTRM's composition and nature of its mandate, dealing with matters of foreign affairs, trade, and policymaking. A president and those who assist him must be free to explore alternatives in the process of shaping policies and making decisions, and to do so in a way many would be unwilling to express except privately. Without doubt, therefore, ensuring and promoting the free exchange of ideas among the members of CTRM tasked to give tariff recommendations to the president were truly imperative. Serena versus Committee on Tariff and Related Matters of the NEDA. Publication of Laws and Regulation. Rationality for Publication of Laws. There is a need for publication of laws to reinforce the right to information. In Tanyara versus Tuvera, the court said that laws must come out in the open, in the clear light of the sun instead of skulking in the shadows with their dark, deep secrets. Mysterious pronouncements and rumored rules cannot be recognized as binding unless their existence and contents are confirmed by a valid publication intended to make full disclosure and give proper notice to the people. Regulations. Publication is necessary to apprise the public of the contents of penal regulations and make the said penalties binding on the persons affected thereby. The Segan versus Angeles. Publication is required in the following. 1. All statutes, including those of local application and private laws. Number 2. President decrees and executive orders promulgated by the President. Number 3. Administrative rules and regulations if their purpose is to enforce and implement existing laws. And 4. Memorandum circulars if they are meant not merely to interpret but to fill in the details which that body is supposed to enforce. Publication is not required in the following. 1. Interpretative regulations and those merely internal in nature, regulating only the personnel of the administrative agency. And 2. Letters of instructions issued by administrative superiors concerning rules and guidelines. Non-impairment of contracts. Any law which introduces a change into the express terms of the contract or its legal construction or its validity or its discharge or the remedy for its enforcement impairs the contract. The law impairs the obligation of contract if 1. It changes the terms and conditions of a legal contract either as to the time or mode of performance or 2. It imposes new conditions or dispenses with those expressed if it authorizes for its satisfaction something different from that provided in its terms. Note, 
mere technical change which does not change the substance of the contract and which still leaves an efficacious remedy for enforcement does not impair the obligation of contracts. A valid exercise of police power is superior to obligation of contract. Applicability of the provision. Note, it is not absolute and it is not to be read with literal exactness. It is restricted to contracts with respect to property or some object of value and which confer rights that may be asserted in a court of justice. It has no application to statutes relating to public subjects within the domain of the general legislative powers of the state and involving the public rights and public welfare of the entire community affected by it. This constitutional provision is applicable only if the obligation of contract is impaired by legislative act, like statute, ordinance, etc. The act need not be by a legislative office, but it should be legislative in nature. Furthermore, the impairment must be substantial. Found in the case Philippine Rural Electric Cooperatives Association versus the ILG Secretary, GR 143076, 2003. In applicability of the provision, 1. In case of franchises, privileges, licenses, etc. Note, these are subject to amendment, alteration, or repeal by Congress when the common good so requires. 2. There is neither public interest involved nor a law that supports the claim. Note, it can only be invoked if it is against the government or when the government intervenes in contract between the parties. Pacific Wide Realty and Development Corporation versus Puerto Azul Land, GR 180-893-2009. Note, the non-impairment clause always yields to the police power of the state and even to the power of taxation and imminent domain for as long as the subject matter of the contract is imbued with paramount public interest. Into every contract is deemed written the police power of the state. Also, the police power may not be bargained away through the medium of a contract or even that of a treaty. Mutuality of contracts, general rule. Valid contracts should be respected by the legislature and not tampered with by subsequent laws that will change the intention of the parties or modify their rights and obligations. Note, the will of the parties to a contract must prevail. A later law which enlarges, abridges, or in any manner changes the intent of the parties to the contract necessarily impairs the contract itself and cannot be given retroactive effect without violating the constitutional prohibition against impairment of contracts. Sangalang versus IAC. Exception. Enactment of laws pursuant to the exercise of police power because public welfare prevails over private rights, it is deemed embedded in every contract a reservation of the state's exercise of police power, eminent domain, and taxation, so long as it deals with a matter affecting the public welfare. PNB versus Remigio, TR 78508, 1994. Question, while still being a GOCC, PAL entered into a commercial agreement and joint services agreement with Kuwait Airways in 1981, establishing a joint commercial arrangement whereby PAL and Kuwait Airways were to jointly operate the Manila, Kuwait, and vice versa route, utilizing the planes and services of Kuwait Airways. In that agreement, PAL may collect royalties from Kuwait Airways. Subsequently, the government lost control over PAL and became a private corporation. After 14 years, delegations from the Philippine government and Kuwait government met. The talks cultivated in a Confidential Memorandum of Understanding, or CMU. The CMU terminates the agreement concerning the royalties effective April 12, 1995. However, Paul insists that the agreement could only be effectively terminated on 31st of October 1995, or the last day of the then-current traffic period, and therefore the provision of the agreement shall continue to be enforced until such date. Can the execution of the CMU between Kuwait and the Philippine governments automatically terminate the commercial agreement? No. An act of the Philippine government negating the commercial agreement between the two airlines would infringe the vested rights of a private individual. 
Since Pyle was already under private ownership of the time the CMU was entered into, the court cannot presume that any and all commitments made by the Philippine government are unilaterally binding on the carrier, even if this comes to the expense of diplomatic embarrassment. Even granting that the police power of the state may be exercised to impair the vested rights of privately owned airlines, the deprivation of property still requires due process of law. Great Airline Corporation versus PA. Free access to courts and adequate legal assistance. Basis? Free access to courts and quasi-judicial bodies and adequate legal assistance shall not be denied to any person by reason of poverty. Section 11, Article 3. Right to free access to courts. This right is the basis for Section 17, Rule 5 of the New Rules of Court, allowing litigation in forma pauper is. Those protected include low-paid employees, domestic servants, and laborers. Cabangas v. Almeida Lopez. Q. The Municipal Trial Court denied JP's petition to litigate in forma pauperis on the ground that JP has regular employment and sources of income, thus cannot be classified as poor or pauper. Is the court's order justified? The answer is no. They need not be persons so poor that they must be supported at public expense. It suffices that the plaintiff is indigent. And the difference between pauper and indigent person is that the latter are persons who have no property or sources of income sufficient for their support aside from their own labor through self-supporting when able to work and in employment. Acker versus Rosal. Question. The Good Shepherd Foundation, Inc., seeks to be exempted from paying legal fees for its indigent and underprivileged clients couching their claim on the free access clause embodied in Section 11, Article 3 of the Constitution. Is the contention tenable? No. The court cannot grant exemption of payment of legal fees to foundations or institutions working for indigent and underprivileged people. According to Section 19, Rule 141, Rules of Court, only a natural party litigant may be regarded as an indigent litigant that can be exempted from payment of legal fees. Exemption cannot be extended to the foundations even if they are working for the indigent and underprivileged people. Re-query of Mr. Roger C. Prioreschi, Exemption from Legal and Filing Fees of the Good Shepherd Foundation, August 19, 2009. Q. A pauper is known to have several parcels of land, but that for several years prior to the filing of the complaint in the inferior court, said parcels of land had been divided and partitioned amongst his children who had since been in possession thereof and paying the taxes thereon. Is he considered indigent? May he apply for free legal assistance? The answer is yes. Republic Act 6034, an act providing transportation and other allowances for indigent litigants, has defined the term indigent to refer to a person who has no visible means of income and whose income is insufficient for the subsistence of his family. Even on the assumption that petitioner owns property, he may still be an indigent considering his sworn statement that he had no income. Under the standards set forth in Acker v. Rosal, as well as the recent legislations heretofore adverted to, it is the income of a litigant that is the determinative factor. For really, property may have no income. It may even B, for a financial burden whose income is insufficient for the subsistence of his family. The case of Inaji versus Ramos Gior, L22109, January 30, 1970. Miranda or custodial investigation rights. These are the rights to which a person under custodial investigation is entitled. At this stage, the person is not yet an accused, as there is yet no case filed against him. He is merely a suspect. The following other rights of suspects. 1. Right to remain silent. 2. Right to competent and independent counsel, preferably of his own choice. 3. Right to be reminded that if he cannot afford the services of a counsel, he would be provided with one. 4. 
right to be informed of his rights. Five, right against torture, force, violence, threat, intimidation, or any other means which vitiate the free will. Six, right against secret detention places, solitary, incommunicado, or similar forms of detention. Seven, right to have confessions or admissions obtained in violation of these rights considered inadmissible in evidence. Miranda versus Arizona. Note, even if the person consents to answer questions without the assistance of counsel, the moment he asks for a lawyer at any time in the investigation, the interrogation must cease until an attorney is present. The Miranda rights are available to avoid involuntary extrajudicial confession. The purpose of providing counsel to a person under custodial investigation is to curb the police state practice of extracting a confession that leads appellant to make self-incriminating statements. People versus Rapisa. Availability. 1. During custodial investigation, as soon as the investigation ceases to be a general inquiry into an unsolved crime and direction is aimed upon a particular suspect, as when the suspect who has been taken into police custody and to whom the police would then direct interrogatory questions, which tend to elicit incriminating statements, or to critical pre-trial stage. RA 7438, an act defining certain rights of persons arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation, and the duties of the arresting, detaining, and investigating officers. This is a special penal law enacted pursuant to Section 12, Paragraph 4, Article 3 of the Constitution. The custodial investigation shall include the practice of issuing an invitation to a person who is under investigation in connection with an offense he is suspected to have committed. Note, rights during custodial investigation apply only against testimonial compulsion and not when the body of the accused is proposed to be examined, that is, urine, sample, photographs, measurement, garments, shoes, which is a purely mechanical act. In the case of Galman v. Pamaran, GRs 712082, August 13, 1985, it was held that the constitutional safeguard is applied notwithstanding that the person is not yet arrested or under detention at the time. However, Father Bernas has qualified this statement by saying that jurisprudence under the um, 1987 Constitution has consistently held following the stricter view that the rights begin to be available only when the person is already in custody. People versus Ting Lan Hui. Furthermore, in the case of People versus Reyes, GR number 178300, March 17, 2009, the court held that the mantle of protection afforded by the above quoted provision covers the period from the time a person is taken into custody for the investigation of his possible participation in the commission of a crime from the time he was singled out as a suspect in the commission of the offense, although not yet in custody. Infraction of the rights of an accused during custodial investigation or the so-called Miranda rights render inadmissible only the extrajudicial confession or admission made during such investigation. The admissibility of other evidence provided they are relevant to the issue is not otherwise excluded by law or rules, is not affected even if obtained or taken in the course of custodial investigation. Ho Wang Pang versus People. An availability of Miranda rights. 1. During a police lineup, unless admissions or confessions are being elicited from the suspect. Gamboa versus Cruz. Number 2. During administrative investigations. Sebastian Jr. versus Gar Chitrena. Number 3. Confessions made by an accused at the time he voluntarily surrendered to the police or outside the context of a formal investigation. Paper versus Baloloi. Number 4. Statements made to a private person. And five, forensic investigation is not tantamount to custodial investigation. Therefore, mirror the rights are not applicable. Waiver. Rights that may be waived. One, right to remain silent and two, right to counsel. Rights that may not be waived. The right of the accused to be given a Miranda right warning is not waivable. Requisites for valid waiver. 
one made voluntarily knowingly and intelligently number two in writing and number three with the presence of counsel people versus galley admissibility of evidence as confession given to news reporters and or media and videotape confessions confessions given in response to a question by news reporters not policemen are admissible where the suspect gave spontaneous answers to a televised interview by several press reporters, his answers are deemed to be voluntary and are admissible. Videotaped confessions are admissible, where it is shown that the accused unburdened his guilt willingly, openly and publicly in the presence of the newsman. Such confessions do not form part of confession in custodial investigations, as it was not given to policemen, but to media in attempt to solicit sympathy and forgiveness from the public. However, due to inherent danger of these videotaped confessions, they must be accepted with extreme caution. They should be presumed involuntary as there may be connivance between the police and the media man, people versus Endino. No, what the Constitution bars is the compulsory disclosure of the incriminating facts or confessions. The rights under Section 12 are guarantees to preclude the slightest use of coercion by the state and not to prevent the suspect from freely and voluntarily telling the truth. People resist undone. Q. Constantio and Barry were charged with the crime of rape with homicide committed against AAA. During the trial, Amparo, a news reporter, testified that he personally interviewed Barry. Amparo declared that during his interview, Barry revealed what happened that night AAA was killed. Attorney Suarez testified that during the custodial investigation, he advised Barry of his constitutional rights and the consequences of his statements. Barry then executed an extrajudicial confession, which was embodied in a Sinumpang Salaysay. However, at the trial, Barry attested that the Sinumpang Salaysay was false and claimed that he was threatened into signing the same. Is the confession admissible? Yes. The court believed that Barry's confession is admissible because it was voluntarily executed with the assistance of a competent and independent counsel in the persons of Attorney Suarez following Section 12, Article 3 of the Constitution. In default of proof that Attorney Suarez was negligent in his duties, the court held that the custodial investigation of Barry was regularly conducted. There was no ample proof to show that Barry's narration of events to Amparo was the product of intimidation or coercion. Barry's extrajudicial confession to Amparo, a news reporter, is deemed voluntary and is admissible in evidence as it was not made to the police authorities or to an investigating officer, People versus Constancio. Once the primary source, the tree, is shown to have been unlawfully obtained, any secondary or derivative evidence, the fruit, derived from it is also inadmissible. Note, the rule is based on the principle that evidence illegally obtained by the state should not be used to gain other evidence because the originally illegally obtained evidence stains all evidence subsequently obtained. Question, Mayor Tatum arrived and proceeded to the investigation room. Upon seeing the mayor, appellant Flores approached him and whispered a request to talk privately. The mayor led appellant to the office of the chief of police and there, Flores broke down and said, Mayor, patawarin mo ko. I will tell you the truth. I am the one who killed Villaroman. The mayor opened the door of the room to let the police and media representatives witness the confession. The mayor first asked for a lawyer to assist appellant, but since no lawyer was available, she ordered the proceedings photographed and videotaped. In the presence of the mayor, the police representatives of the media and appellant's own wife and son Appellants confessed his guilt. His confession was captured in videotape and covered by the media nationwide. Did such counseled confession violate the suspect's constitutional rights? No. A confession given to the mayor may be admitted in evidence if such confession by the suspect was given to the mayor as a confidant and not as a law enforcement officer. In such a case, the counseled confession did not violate the suspect's constitutional rights what the Constitution bars is the compulsory disclosure of incriminating facts or confessions. The rights under Section 12 are guarantees to preclude the slightest use of coercion by the state 
and not to prevent the suspect from freely and voluntarily telling the truth. People resist and done. Question accused Aquino Lauga was charged and convicted of the crime of rape of his 13 year old daughter, AAA. During the proceedings, Juan Paulo Nepusemo, a Bantay Bayanin, the barangay, testified that the accused confessed that he had in fact raped AAA. The trial court found him guilty of the crime of rape. Lauga contends that the extrajudicial confession he made to Nepusemo is an inadmissible in evidence and it was made without assistance of counsel. Is his contention tenable? Yes. A barangay bantaybayan is considered a public officer and any extrajudicial confession made to him without the assistance of counsel is inadmissible in evidence as provided for under Section 12, Article 3 of the Constitution. People versus Lauga. Rights of the accused. One, due process. Two, be presumed innocent. Three, be heard by himself and counsel. Four, be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation against him. Five, a speedy, impartial, and public trial. Six, meet the witnesses face to face. Seven, have compulsory process to secure the attendance of witnesses and production of evidence on his behalf, 8. Against double jeopardy, and 9. Bail. Q. Go was charged with other deceits under Article 318 of the RPC. Upon arraignment, he pleaded not guilty. The prosecution's complaining witness, Li Ping, a frail old businessman from Laos, Cambodia, traveled from his home country back to the Philippines just to attend the hearing. However, trial dates were subsequently postponed due to his unavailability. Subsequently, the private prosecutor filed with the METC a motion to take oral deposition of Li Ping, alleging that he was being treated for lung infection at the Cambodia Charity Hospital in Laos, Cambodia, and that, upon doctor's advice, he could not make the long travel to the Philippines by reason of ill health. Can Li Ping take his deposition in Laos, Cambodia? The answer is no. Nowhere in Section 15, Rule 119 of the rules, specifically in criminal proceedings, permits the taking of deposition outside the Philippines, whether the deponent is sick or not. The conditional examination of a prosecution witness cannot defeat the rights of the accused to public trial and confrontation of witnesses. Hari Go versus People of the Philippines, GR number 185527, July 18, 2012. By Justice Perlas Bernabe. Criminal due process. No person shall be held to answer for a criminal offense without due process of law. Requisites of criminal due process. One accused is heard by a court of competent jurisdiction. Number two, accused is proceeded against under the orderly processes of law. Number three, accused is given notice and opportunity to be heard. And number four, judgment must be rendered after lawful hearing. Right to appeal, not a natural right. The right to appeal is neither a natural right nor part of due process. It is a mere statutory right, but once given, denial constitutes violation of the process. Right to speedy disposition of cases. Right to speedy disposition of cases is the right that is available to all persons in all kinds of proceedings, whether criminal, civil, or administrative. Unlike the right to speedy trial, which is available only to an accused in a criminal case and therefore only the accused may invoke such, the right to speedy disposition of cases is different from the right to speedy trial to the extent that the former applies to all cases, whether judicial, quasi-judicial, or administrative cases, whereas the latter applies to criminal cases only. Violation The right to a speedy disposition of a case, like the right to a speedy trial, is deemed violated only when the proceedings are attended by vexatious, capricious, and oppressive delays, or when unjustified postponements of the trial are asked for and secured, or even without cause or justifiable motive, a long period of time is allowed to elapse without the party having his case tried. Roquero versus Chancellor of UP Manila.
In determining whether the accused has been deprived of his right to a speedy disposition of the case and to a speedy trial, four factors must be considered. 1. Length of delay. 2. The reason for the delay. Letter C. The defendant's assertion of his right. And 4. Prejudice to the defendant. Question. Luz Almeda, Schools Division Superintendent of the Dep Ed, was being charged of violation of RA 3019. However, the preliminary investigation proceedings took more than 11 long years to resolve due to the repeated endorsement of the case between the Office of the Ombudsman and the Office of the Special Prosecutor. It is attributed to the Ombudsman's failure to realize that Almeida was not under the jurisdiction of the OSP or the Sandy Combayan. Almeida then prays for the dismissal of the case against her, claiming that there was a violation of her right to speedy trial. Is she correct? The answer is yes. The right includes within its contemplation the periods before, during, and after trial, such as preliminary investigations and fact-finding investigations conducted by the Office of the Ombudsman. Further, this right applies to all cases pending before all judicial, quasi-judicial, or administrative bodies and not limited to the accused in criminal proceedings, but extends to all parties in all cases, be it civil or administrative in nature. Almeida v. Office of the Ombudsman Right to Public Trial General Rule Trials must be public in order to prevent possible abuses, which may be committed against the accused, and 2. The attendance of the trial is open to all, irrespective of their relationship to the accused. Exception, if the evidence to be adduced is offensive to decency or public morals, the public may be excluded. Section 21, Rule 119 of the Rules of Criminal Procedure. Public trial is not synonymous with publicized trial. The right to a public trial belongs to the accused. The requirement of a public trial is satisfied by the opportunity of the members of the public and the press to attend the trial and to report what they have observed. The accused's right to a public trial should not be confused with the freedom of the press and the public's right to know as a justification for allowing the live broadcast of the trial. The tendency of a high-profile case like the subject case to generate undue publicity with its concomitant undesirable effects weighs heavily against broadcasting the trial. Moreover, the fact that the accused has legal remedies after the fact is of no moment since the damage has been done and may be irreparable. It must be pointed out that the fundamental right to due process of the accused cannot be afforded after the fact but must be protected at the first instance. Right against self-incrimination basis. No person shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. This constitutional privilege has been defined as a protection against testimonial compulsion, but this has since been extended to any evidence communicative in nature acquired under circumstances of duress. People versus all this, and that is Section 17, Article 3 of the Constitution, Note, what is prohibited is the use of physical or moral compulsion to extort communication from the witness or to otherwise elicit evidence which would not exist were it not for the actions compelled from the witness, not the inclusions of his body in evidence when it may be material. For instance, substance emitted from the body of the accused may be received as evidence in prosecution for acts of lasciviousness. U.S. v. Tan Teng and morphine forced out of the mouth of the accused may also be used as evidence against him. U.S. v. Ong Siu Hong Consequently, although accused appellant insists that here samples was forcibly taken from him and submitted to the NBI for forensic examination, the hair samples may be admitted in evidence against him, for what is prescribed is the use of testimonial compulsion or any evidence communicative of the nature acquired from the accused under duress, People v. Rondero. The right is available in 1. Criminal cases, civil cases, administrative cases, impeachment, other legislative investigations that possesses a criminal or penal aspect. Note, it does not apply to private investigations done by private individual, 
BPI versus CASA. When the privilege against self-incrimination is violated outside of the court, say by the police, then the testimony, as already noted, is not admissible under the exclusionary rule. When the privilege is violated by the court itself, that is, by the judge, the court is ousted of its jurisdiction. All its proceedings are null and void, and it is as if no judgment has been rendered. Chavez v. C.A. Note, this right may be invoked not only in criminal cases, but even in administrative proceedings that partake of a criminal nature. Secretary of Justice v. Lantion. This may even be invoked during inquiries in aid of legislation in the Congress and even on impeachment proceedings. Benson v. Senate. Ribbon Committee. Incriminating questions. A question tends to incriminate when the answer of the accused or the witness would establish a fact which would be a necessary link in a chain of evidence to prove the commission of a crime by the accused or the witness. Note, the privilege against self-incrimination is not self-executing or automatically operational. It must be claimed. It follows that the right may be waived expressly or impliedly as by a failure to claim it at the appropriate time. The privilege against self-incrimination can be claimed only when the specific question, incriminatory in character, is actually addressed to the witness. It cannot be claimed at any other time. It does not give a witness the right to disregard a subpoena, to decline to appear before the court at the time appointed. Rosette versus Slim. Right against self-incrimination of an accused versus right against self-incrimination of a witness. Difference. Accused can refuse to take the witness stand altogether by invoking the right against self-incrimination. By an ordinary witness, she or he cannot refuse to take the witness stand, can only refuse to answer specific questions which would incriminate him or her in the commission of an offense. Note, for in reality, the purpose of calling an accused as a witness for the people would be to incriminate him. The rule positively intends to avoid and prohibit the certainly inhuman procedure of compelling a person to furnish the missing evidence necessary for his conviction. Chavez versus CA. Right against double jeopardy. No person shall be twice put in jeopardy of punishment for the same offense. If an act is punished by a law and an ordinance, conviction or acquittal under either shall constitute a bar to other prosecution for the same act. Two kinds of double jeopardy. One, double jeopardy for the same offense, first sentence, section 21 of article 3, and number two, double jeopardy for the same act, second sentence, section 21 of article 3, people versus Quijada. Requisites, legal jeopardy touches only upon one, valid complaint or information, number two, filed before a competent court, number three, the arraignment of the accused, number four, to which he had pleaded, and number five, defendant was previously acquitted or convicted or the case dismissed or otherwise terminated without his express consent. Saldi Raga versus Panganiban. Note, consent of the accused to the dismissal cannot be implied or presumed. It must be expressed as to have no doubt as to the accused's conformity. Sa KS versus IAC. To substantiate a claim of double jeopardy, the following must be proven. 1. A first jeopardy must have attached prior to the second. Number 2. The first jeopardy must have been validly terminated. And number 3. The second jeopardy must be for the same offense, or the second offense includes or is necessarily included in the offense charged in the first information, or is an attempt to commit the same, or is a frustration thereof. Rationale. To reconsider a judgment of acquittal places the accused twice in jeopardy for being punished for the same crime of which he has already been absolved. There is reason for this provision of the Constitution. In criminal cases, the full power of the state is ranged against the accused. If there is no limit to attempt to prosecute the accused for the same offense after he has been acquitted, the infinite power and capacity of the state for a sustained and repeated litigation would eventually overwhelm the accused in terms of resources, stamina, and the will to fight. 
Lee Hanover's people. Grant of Gamerer to evidence operators and acquittal. The general rule that the grant of a demurrer to evidence operators and acquittal and is thus final and unappealable to it. The demurrer to evidence in criminal cases such as the one at bar is filed after the prosecution had rested its case. And when the same is granted, it calls for an appreciation of the evidence adduced by the prosecution and its sufficiency to warrant conviction beyond reasonable doubt, resulting in a dismissal of the case on the merits, tantamount to an acquittal of the accused. Such dismissal of a criminal case by the grant of demur to evidence may not be appealed, for to do so would be to place the accused in double jeopardy, the verdict being one of acquittal, the case ends there. Question. Former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo filed a demur to evidence as a defense in the criminal case filed against her. The Supreme Court granted the said petition. The office of the Ombudsman moved to the reconsideration of the decision. As a defense, GMA contends that the decision has effectively barred the consideration and granting of the motion for reconsideration of the state, because doing so would amount to re-prosecution or revival of the charge against her despite her acquittal and would thereby violate the constitutional prescription against double jeopardy. Is the contention of GMA tenable? The answer is yes. The general rule is that the grant of a demurrer to evidence operates as an acquittal and is thus final and unappealable. The demurrer to evidence in criminal cases such as the one at par is filed after the prosecution had rested its case, and when the same is granted, it calls for an appreciation of the evidence adduced by the prosecution in its sufficiency to warrant conviction beyond reasonable doubt, resulting in a dismissal of the case on the merits, tantamount to an acquittal of the accused. Such dismissal of a criminal case by the grant of demur to evidence may not be appealed, for to do so would be to place the accused in double jeopardy, the verdict being one of Acquittal, the case ends there. Macabal Agorio versus People of the Philippines. Exceptions to the right against double jeopardy. 1. When the trial court acted with grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction. Number 2. The accused was not acquitted, nor was there a valid and legal dismissal or termination of the case. Number 3. Dismissal of the case was during the preliminary investigation. Number 4. It does not apply to administrative cases. And number 5. Dismissal or termination of the case was with the express consent of the accused. No, when the dismissal is made at the instance of the accused, there is no double jeopardy. General rule, double jeopardy is not available when the case is dismissed other than on the merits or other than by acquittal or conviction upon motion of the accused personally or through counsel. Since such dismissal is regarded as with express consent of the accused, who is therefore deemed to have waived the right to plea double jeopardy. Exceptions. Dismissal based on insufficiency of evidence. Number two, dismissal because of denial of accused right to speedy trial. And number three, accused is discharged to be a state witness. Number six, when the case was provisionally dismissed. Number seven, the graver offense developed due to supervening facts arising from the same act or omission constituting the former charge. Note on doctrine of supervening event, the accused may still be prosecuted for another offense if the subsequent development changes the character of the first indictment under which he may have already been charged or convicted. Eight, the facts constituting the graver of charge became known or were discovered only after a plea was entered in the former complaint or information. Number nine, the plea of guilty to a lesser offense was made without the consent of the prosecutor and of the offended party except as otherwise provided in Section 1, Letter F, Rule 116. Question. Hans, a writer in Q Magazine, published an article about Carlos' illicit affair with other women. The magazine also happened to have a website where the same article was published. Carlo then filed a libel case against Hans, both under the revised penal code and the cyber crime law. Is there a violation of the prescription against double jeopardy? The answer is yes. There should be no question that if the published material on print 
said to be libelous is again posted online or vice versa, that identical material cannot be the subject of two separate libels. The two offenses, one a violation of Article 353 of the Revised Penal Code and the other a violation of Section 4, Letter C, Number 4 of RA 10175, involve essentially the same element, are in fact one and the same offense. Online libel under Section 4, Letter C, Number 4 is not a new crime, but is one already punished under Article 353. Section 4, letter C, number 4, merely establishes the computer system as another means of publication. Charging the offender under both laws would be a blatant violation of the prescription against double jeopardy. Question, Jet was convicted for reckless imprudence resulting in slight physical injuries. Can he still be prosecuted for reckless imprudence resulting in homicide and damage to property arising from the same incident? No. The doctrine that reckless imprudence under Article 365 is a single quasi-offense by itself and not merely a means to commit other crimes, such that conviction or acquittal of such quasi-offense bars subsequent prescription for the same quasi-offense, regardless of its various resulting acts. Reason and precedent both coincide in that once convicted or acquitted of a specific act of reckless imprudence, the accused may not be prosecuted again for the same act. For the essence of quasi-offense of criminal negligence under Article 365 of the Revised Penal Code lies in the execution of an imprudent or negligent act, that is, if intentionally done, would be punishable as a felony. The law penalizes thus the negligent or careless act, not the result thereof. The gravity of the consequence is only taken into account to determine the penalty, it does not qualify the substance of the offense. And, as the careless act is single, whether the injurious result should affect one person or several persons, the offense, criminal negligence, remains one and the same, and cannot be split into different crimes and prosecutions. Jason Ivler, E. Aguilar v. Honorable Modesto San Pablo Involuntary Servitude it is the condition where one is compelled by force, coercion, or imprisonment and against his will to labor for another whether he is paid or not. General rule, no involuntary servitude shall exist. Exceptions. P-S-E-C-O-M. 1. Punishment for a crime for which the party has been duly convicted. S. Personal, military, or civil service in the interest of national defense. And E. In a naval enlistment, a person who enlists in a merchant ship may be compelled to remain in service until the end of a voyage. Number four, posse comitatus, or the conscription of able-bodied men for the apprehension of criminals. Number five, O, return to work order issued by the Dole Secretary or the President. And number six, which is M, minors under Patria potestas are obliged to obey their parents. Rights against excessive fines and cruel and inhuman punishment. It has long been held that the prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment is generally aimed at the form or character of the punishment rather than its severity in respect of duration or amount, and applies to punishments which public sentiment has regarded as cruel or obsolete, for instance, those inflicted at the weeping posts or in the pillory, burning at the stake, breaking on the wheel, disemboweling, and the like, fine and imprisonment would not thus be within the prohibition. It takes more than merely being a harsh, excessive, out of proportion, or severe for a penalty to be obnoxious to the Constitution. Note, the fact that the punishment authorized by the statute is severe does not make it cruel and unusual. Purpose versus people. No, mere extinguishment of life alone does not constitute cruel, degrading, inhuman punishment. To be such, it must involve prolonged agony and suffering. It refers more to the nature of the punishment to be inflicted upon a convict, that which is shocking to the conscience of mankind under contemporary standards. The Chagrai. Cruel and inhuman penalty. A penalty is cruel and inhuman if it involves torture 
or lingering suffering that is being drawn and quartered. Degrading penalty. A penalty is degrading if it exposes a person to public humiliation, example being tarred and feathered, then paraded throughout town. Note, the power to reimpose the death penalty for certain heinous crimes is vested in the Congress, not in the President. After all, the power to define crimes and impose penalties is legislative in nature. Non-imprisonment for death basis. No person shall be imprisoned for debt or non-payment of a poll tax. Debt, it is any civil obligation arising from contract. Poll tax is a specific sum levied upon any person belonging to a certain class without regard to property or occupation. Example, community tax. Note, a tax is not a debt since it is an obligation arising from law. Hence, its non-payment may be validly punished with imprisonment. Only poll tax is covered by the constitutional provision. If an accused fails to pay the fines imposed upon him, this may result in his subsidiary imprisonment because his liability is ex delicto and not ex contracto. Generally, a debtor cannot be imprisoned for failure to pay his debt. However, if he contracted his debt through fraud, he can be validly punished in a criminal action as his responsibility arises not from the contract of loan, but from commission of a crime. Lozana v. Martinez Ex post facto law and bill of attainder. An ex post facto law is any law that makes an action done before the passage of the law and which was innocent when done, criminal and punishes such action. United States versus Vicente Diaz. Kinds of ex post facto law. It can be a law that makes an act which was innocent when done, criminal and punishes such action. Number two, aggravates a crime or makes it greater than when it was committed. Number three, changes the punishment and inflicts a greater punishment than the law annexed to the crime when it was committed. Number four, alters the legal rules of evidence and receives less or different testimony than the law required at the time of the commission of the offense in order to convict the defendant. Six, assumes to regulate civil rights and remedies only. In effect, imposes penalty or deprivation of a right for something which, when done, was lawful. And six, deprives a person accused of a crime of some lawful protection to which he has become entitled, such as the protection of a former conviction or acquittal or a proclamation of amnesty. Characteristics of ex post facto law. Um, it must refer to criminal matters. Number two, be retroactive in its application in to the prejudice of the accused. Bill of Attainder. It is a legislative act that inflicts punishment without trial, its essence being the substitution of legislative fiat for a judicial determination of guilt. Note, it is only when a statute applies either to named individuals or easily ascertainable members of a group in such a way as to inflict punishment on them without a judicial trial that it becomes a bill of attainder. There are two kinds of a bill of attainders, bill of attainder proper legislative imposition of the death penalty and bill of pains and penalties imposition of a lesser penalty.